This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in just a bit. Hottest hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal of New Orleans. They have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleans and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens and the worst, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Those are words purported to be from New Orleans' most notorious and most mysterious serial killer, a man who broke into people's homes at night and butchered them where they slept. The man who made a demand, unlike any other killer in history, to have the entire city filled with the swinging sounds of jazz music or risk incurring his murderous wrath. The man who came to be known as the Axeman of New Orleans. The terror started on the night of May the 23rd, 1918. As the city of New Orleans slept, an intruder broke into the house of Joseph and Catherine Maggio on the corner of Magnolia Street and Upper Line. He found an axe in the garden, went inside the bedroom, and butchered both husband and wife in their sleep. Joseph Maggio was probably targeted first since he was still in bed when the crime was discovered, while Catherine's body lay on the floor in a pool of blood, indicating that she may have awoken during the attack and tried to make a run for it, although it proved to be in vain. The couple had no children, although Joseph's young her brother Andrew Maggio lived with them, and he was in the next room sleeping off a late drinking session when they were killed. It wasn't until the next morning around 5am that Andrew Maggio woke up and heard moans coming from the adjoining room. He banged on the wall, but he did not receive a reply, so he left the house and ran to another sibling, Jacob Maggio, who lived a block away, and told him what had happened. Together they went to pick up the fourth Maggio brother, Salvatore, and the trio returned to the house about half an hour later and finally entered the bedroom. Before them lay a ghastly sight, one which was described in the afternoon edition of that day's The New Orleans States. Lying diagonally across the bed, with his feet touching the floor, was the body of Joseph Maggio. On the floor, alongside the bed, and resting across the feet of her husband, lay the dead body of his wife. The floors and bed were smeared with blood. The man was not yet dead. Jake Maggio summoned the police, while Andrew telephoned the charity hospital ambulance. He died shortly after the arrival of the interns from the hospital. The authorities arrived on the scene to investigate the double homicide. Footprints suggested that the killer hopped the fence, which surrounded the house, and then used a screwdriver to pry out a panel from the door and crawl through it inside. The murder weapon he used appeared to be an axe, which he found in the Maggio's backyard, and he left it in the bedroom after he was done. At first, police suspected that the crime was a robbery, which turned to homicide, but there were several clues that did not point in that direction. For starters, the killer left the jewelry behind. Joseph Maggio had a safe, which was indeed found open, but it showed no signs of forced entry. The grocer had recently deposited a large sum into the bank, around $650, so it may be that the safe was already open because it was empty. Otherwise, the only way the killer would have gotten it open without leaving any marks was if he knew the combination. This led the police to consider the possibility of it being an inside job, with the younger brother being involved somehow. After all, this was only the first attack, and authorities had no way of knowing it was the beginning of a crime spree, and the presence of Andrew Maggio did raise a lot of questions. How come he didn't hear any noises during the attack, but was later woken up by the moans coming from the bedroom? And speaking of the bedroom, why didn't he enter it immediately, and instead left to collect his other brothers? It could have been that he panicked, or that he was scared, but it could also have been that he wanted witnesses, since he knew what he was going to find in there. And why did the killer spare him anyway? Was it that he did not know that Andrew Maggio was also in the house, or was it because he himself was doing the killing? These suspicions were enough to turn the younger brother into the chief suspect. He was arrested later that day, and continued investigations uncovered even more evidence that incriminated him. In the backyard of the Maggio home, police found the screwdriver used to gain entry to the house. In the next yard, they found a pair of blood-soaked socks and a bloody razor. Despite the Axeman's moniker, in this particular case, the razor turned out to be the main murder weapon, as the killer used it to cut 
the throats of Joseph and Catherine Maggio. Only afterwards did he use the axe on them, maybe as the police suspected at the time, in an attempt to hide the initial wounds. The reason they found this suspicious was because Andrew Maggio was a barber and the razor was just like the ones he used at work. The authorities thought this was going to be a straightforward case. Andrew Maggio was in custody and they fully expected to bring charges against him. However, the case soon started falling apart. The razor turned out not to belong to the barber and even though his story was a bit fishy, there was no evidence to contradict it. He was released a few days after the killing and Eventually, the police focused their efforts in another direction, with the police superintendent saying that the case had taken a peculiar turn and will become more interesting from the standpoint of the investigators. The next attack occurred on June 27, 1918, when the Axeman targeted Louis Basuma and Harriet Lowe, sometimes identified as Anna Lowe, while they were sleeping in the back of his grocery shop at the corner of Dorje Noir and La Harpe. Like Joseph Maggio, Basuma was an Italian shopkeeper, showing that the killer may have had a type when it came to choosing his victims. The couple was discovered in the early hours of the morning by John Zanker, a bakery van driver who was making his routine delivery. When nobody met him to open the shop, he went into the bedroom in the back and found Basuma and Lowe sitting in puddles of blood, but still alive. Both had gushing head injuries that had been made by an axe which had been left in the bathroom. No razor was used this time. Zanker alerted the police and both victims were taken to the hospital. They would both later regain consciousness. There were a lot of similarities between this attack and the Maggio murders. In both cases, the intruder ambushed a sleeping couple in their bedroom. He used an axe that he found inside the house and he gained entry by knocking out a panel in the door. But police were still reluctant to call both attacks the work of the same madman, so instead they investigated it as an individual robbery and looked for suspects with a connection to Basuma. Initially, John Zanker was treated as a suspect, but other than the fact that he found the bodies, there was nothing to suggest that he was the culprit. Then police shifted their attention to a black man named Louis Ubicon, who had recently started working in Basuma's store. Like Zanker, he was more a suspect of convenience rather than somebody with actual evidence against him. His alibi was a little weak, but that was about it. But Harriet Lowe insisted that her attacker was not black, so again the police began looking for somebody else, and that was when the case Case took a rather strange turn. Harriet Lowe had made a series of unusual statements. The attack on her had been much more vicious than on Basuma. She had suffered brain damage and went in and out of delirium, and in fact, she died seven weeks later from her injuries. In the meantime, she was reluctant to cooperate with the police or the press, mainly because she feared the scandal that became front page news when it was discovered that she was not married to the grocer, but she was his mistress. But even more bizarrely, she became increasingly convinced that it was Basuma himself who attacked her. The police warmed up to this idea. They found letters in Basuma's home in different languages in Yiddish and German and Russian, so they flirted with the idea of the whole grocer routine was an act, and he was in fact a German spy, part of a secret espionage ring, and that he attacked Harriet Lowe when she discovered his true identity. She agreed with this conclusion, but again, Harriet Lowe was delirious and lingering on the brink of death. When she finally did die, police arrested Louis Basuma on a murder charge, and he was imprisoned for nine months awaiting trial before a sensible jury acquitted him after ten minutes of deliberation in May 1919. Now we'll return to our murder mystery in just a moment, but first, here's a word from today's video sponsor, Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're reaching into their savings account to start a new business or launch a blog, something like that. And with Squarespace, the web really is yours. Squarespace is an incredible tool to fashion a website into whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about the website and its design. Well, use one of their beautiful templates and that will be a perfect solution. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person, you want to tinker with that design, you got a lot of opinions about what exactly it should look like, well, Squarespace is fully customizable, so you can tinker all you want. Once you're done setting up your website, there are a ton of extra features that Squarespace provides so that your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. Really, everything you need is in there. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can just go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to the Axeman. man. 
There had been two attacks so far, resulting in three deaths, and in each case, the police tried to charge someone tied to the victims. They had not connected the two assaults yet, at least not publicly. It was after the third that they admitted that New Orleans might have an axe-wielding madman on the loose. It happened on August 5, 1918, when 28 year old Anna Schneider was attacked in her bedroom late in the evening. The woman was eight months pregnant, and she awoke during the night to see a shadowy figure looming over her who began hitting her in the head with an object. Some sources reported that it was an axe, while others said that it was a lamp from a bedside. Table. Her husband, Ed Schneider, arrived home from work after midnight, found his wife, and took her to the hospital. Her scalp had been cut open and she was missing multiple teeth, but Mrs. Schneider had not only survived the attack, but went on to deliver her baby a few days later. Unfortunately for the police, she did not become their key witness they were hoping for. Anna Schneider couldn't remember anything about her attacker and was unable to provide a description. Clearly, the Axeman was unhappy with the results of this latest hit, because this time he only waited five days before striking again. On August the 10th, the killer attacked Joseph Romano, an elder man who lived with his two nieces. On that morning, the two young women were woken up by the commotion and entered their uncle's room to see that the man had received a heavy axe blow to the head. He remained conscious until the ambulance arrived, but Joseph Romano died a couple of days later. This attack shared a lot more similarities to the first two than the one at the Schneider house. For starters, the intruder targeted an Italian proprietor again. Joseph Romano had a barbershop in the neighborhood. He definitely used an axe this time, which he dumped in a backyard, and he gained entry to the house by knocking out a panel. Now there was no way to avoid a panic anymore. New Orleans knew that it had a killer in its midst, and the city fell into chaos. As police began receiving countless reports of people seeing axemen in their neighborhoods, and parents started staying awake in turn to guard their families while they slept. A few people even reported finding discarded axes in their backyards in the morning, either as the result of pranks or as a sign that they almost received a visit from the axeman. All the fear and attention seemed to satiate the madman because he waited for eight months before killing again. For his next attack, the Axeman decided to venture off the beaten path, and instead of striking in New Orleans again, he crossed the Mississippi River into Gretna, Louisiana, and committed his most heinous assault. He targeted an entire family of Italian immigrants, the father, Charles Cordmiglia, who worked as a grocer, the mother, Rosie, and their two-year-old daughter, Mary. It happened on the night of March 10, 1919. The scene was the same as the rest. A panel had been chiseled out of the back door, and a bloody axe was found left in the yard. The Cordmiglia family was discovered by their neighbors, the Giordano, who responded to their screams. Both Charles and Rosie had sustained bloody head wounds and skull fractures, but they were taken to the hospital and survived the attack. Unfortunately, the young Mary died from a blow to the back of the head. Despite the clear similarities in the crimes, police once again were looking to arrest someone with ties to the Cordmiglia family instead of a serial killer, and they found an even more unexpected suspect than Louis Sumer, the alleged German spy. Two suspects, in fact, Orlando and Frank Giordano, the father and the son, who responded to the family's call for help. For reasons known only to her, Rosie Cormiglia claims that the Giordanos were the ones who attacked them and killed her daughter. There was a mild motive. The Giordanos were also grocers in direct competition with Charles Cormiglia, and they had quarreled in the past. However, it was almost entirely on Rosie's testimony that the father and son were arrested and quickly convicted. Orlando Giordano was sentenced to life in prison while his son was given the death penalty. Gretna police made no attempt to connect their case to the Axeman murders, insisting that that was something which was happening in New Orleans and did not concern them. There were several reasons why the Giordanos were not the attackers, apart from a complete lack of evidence. For starters, Giordano Giordano was almost 70 years old. He was too weak and frail to commit the crimes. Frank Giordano would have been strong enough to do it, but at six feet and over 200 pounds, he was too big to fit through the door panel that had been removed. But the most obvious sign of their innocence was the fact that Charles Cortemiglia did not back up his wife's story. At first, he said that he had no recollection of the attack, but later became convinced that his wife was lying. Eventually, Rosie Cortemiglia did admit the lie and the father and son were acquitted of the crimes, but the true story behind this bizarre event is still unclear, as there are too many versions out there. Some say that Rosie Cortemiglia tried to frame the Giordanos out of jealousy and spite. Her doctor believed it was because of the trauma and brain damage she had suffered in the attack. Rosie herself said that she had been coerced into doing it by Gretna police, and that later the district attorney threatened her with a perjury charge and prison time if she recanted. Eventually, she decided to come clean anyway after St. Joseph appeared to her in a dream and encouraged her to confess. Despite all the unusual evidence of the Cortemiglia case, 
The most surprising aspect of the whole crime spree occurred a few days after the attack, when the New York Times Picayune received a letter purported to be from the axe man himself. We've already mentioned part of it. It contains the kind of stuff you would expect from a deranged killer. He talked about how big and scary he was, how incompetent the police were, and how the entire city was at his mercy. But the ending of the letter came with a very strange demand. Here is what it said. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time that I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of you people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse. Hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee, I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fantasy, the axe man. His instructions were pretty clear. The letter was published on March the 13th, and the date of the big party would have been March the 19th. What really happened on that night is somewhat murky today, after many repeated and exaggerated retellings. However, the story goes that the entire city of New Orleans jazzed it out per the Axeman's demand. Dance halls and jazz clubs were filled to capacity. Pianos and record players could be heard playing in people's homes. One local musician named Joseph John de Villa even composed a piece to commemorate the event, which he titled The Mysterious Axeman's Jazz. Don't scare me, Papa. Nobody was killed that night. Some say that the Axeman walked the streets of New Orleans all night, delighted to see that he got an entire city to do his bidding. Others are skeptical that the letter even came from the killer. After all, it didn't contain any details or identifiers that only the Axeman would know. If it was a hoax, then it ended up making the killer far more notorious than the murders themselves. At least three more attacks occurred that year, which are usually attributed to the Axeman. A fourth one might have been averted when a man named William Carson scared away an intruder by firing a few shots in his direction. The three targets were Steve Boker, Sarah Lawman, and Mike Peppertone. Boker and Lawman were both attacked, but managed to make enough noise to alert the neighbors and prompt their assailant to flee. They both recovered from their injuries, although neither one could provide any useful clues as to the identity of their attacker. Mike Peppertone's story is a bit more uncertain. His wife found him at around 1 a.m. He was still alive, although unconscious after being struck in the head numerous times. The murder weapon was unclear. It wasn't an axe, maybe because the attacker could not find one, and it could have been an iron bar of some kind or a large bolt. Mike Peppertone died in the hospital after a few hours, and many consider him to be the axe man's sixth and final victim, although others have asserted that his attack may have been mob-related and not committed by the serial killer. Either way, after 1919, the axe man of New Orleans disappeared and was never heard from again. The same three possibilities were put forward as in any crime spree that stops suddenly. The killer died, he moved away, or he was imprisoned for unrelated offenses. His identity has never been established. The police certainly tried to charge plenty of people for the crimes. Andrew Maggio, Louis Basuma, Louis Ubicon, Iolando, and Frank Giordano. But these were more about wanting to clear the murders at any cost by finding someone who fit the bill, rather than actually following the evidence. But there is one more notable name to mention, one which has become a popular suspect among crime buffs. Joseph Mumfra or Momfra. He wasn't on the police's radar, but in December 1921, he was gunned down on the streets of Los Angeles. His killer was Esther Peppertone, the widow of Mike Peppertone, purported to be the Axeman's final victim. When being interrogated by the police, she claimed that he was the man responsible for her husband's death. Ever since then, Joseph Mumfra has been put forward as a likely candidate for being the Axeman, but the criminal records and historical documents don't back up this claim. According to surviving newspaper articles from that time, Esther did shoot this man, who went by several names, but it was because she thought he was connected to the disappearance of her second husband and not her first. After Mike Peppertone's murder, she moved away and married a man named Angelo Albano, who went missing, but due to numerous retellings and inaccurate reporting from the media, the story changed that she was avenging the death of Mike Peppertone and consequently Mumfra became suspected of being the Axeman. It appears that he is simply another entry in a pretty long line of dubious suspects with confusing stories, but that in and of itself adds a unique layer to this killing spree and makes the Axeman of New Orleans stand out as one of the most mysterious and distinctive killers in the annals of crime. So I really hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace, and thank you for watching.